history of MIL and now computers produced by them. So speaking about memory products, yes, occasionally you can still get the catalog. Um, and you will see how rich the offering was in terms of uh, uh, these semiconductor products. Okay. MF7114, I mentioned to you a brief history, but it's really a fantastic story if you compare this with, uh, with the development of 4004 at Intel. Um, so after engineers, MIL engineers coming home, so to speak, they continued, uh, they decided to continue with work on 7114, maybe to sell it as a chipset together with uh, ROMs and RAMs as a chipset for calculators, but maybe something else. Uh, but something else uh, uh, will turn out to be uh, the, the first commercial microprocessor-based computer. Yes, Intel was putting together some microprocessor-based hardware earlier, but they never claimed that these were computers, or they were never made to be computers, to be general purpose computers. On the other hand, MIL decided to build a general purpose computer and to sell it as such. Now, there are no 7114s around. I mean, how many of you who are collecting vintage CPUs have 7114 in your collection? In our museum at York, we have a paperweight, mm -hmm. which was a promotional piece given to important customers and that's 7114 and supporting chips. That's, to my knowledge, the only survivor. Maybe there are some calculators around. I heard that Olympia calculators uh, used uh, MIL processors to uh, in, in their product. But anyway, so that's the, the, the chip. Fortunately, what's nice is that there is no cover, there is no lid on the CPU, and through Microsoft Code you can inspect circuitry. So that's, that, that's, really but that's, as I said, the only thing that survived. And not only that, but it's the only processor known to me, but also eventually the computer that they will build to support it, the CPS-1, will also be, uh, will not survive. Now, I also mentioned the 8080 chip that they put together in 74, so that's, uh, that's MIL chip, at least the corner here, that's the Intel chip, and if you compare that, you'll see that there are some significant changes, at least visually, as an artwork, where they were really, because the claim was that this was not just a clone of, uh, of 8080, but uh, uh, some improvements uh, have been made. Now, the only 8080, I know two people who have that chip, and one of them, that's that's the chip. Uh, this is this chip actually found its way to Scandinavia, and it looks like it's an early version with some engineering notes on it. So that's, uh, that's one of maybe two or three MF 8080s that survived out of very many that were produced. Okay, MIL mic microcomputers. Let's uh, move a little bit forward, 1972. So 1970, 1971, buying all sorts of technologies and starting manufacturing uh, memory and microprocessors. In 1972, if you look at the situation in microcomputing, there are still no microcomputers on the market. Well, there are microprocessor-based hardware on the market, but not computers. But some of them are aware in the making, like RTE Micro or Canadian MCM70, uh, eventually announced a, a, a year later in 1973. So, between 72 and 74, you have a design of the first computers from MIL CP, CPS1. CPS1 stands for Chip Processor System First Try. And it was designed to be. Uh, on the basis of 7114. Now, yeah, here are some of the names. Juan Monica was running the group, CPS1. This, uh, Lars Schweizer was the, uh, the main engineer behind the project. Uh, some uh, technical literature survived. 
and we have it in the, in, the, in our museum, so you can you can learn a lot about about this particular computer. Uh, here is the manifesto. So this is how this is important when you when you when you try to understand what they were trying to do. It's not to experiment with. Uh, uh, with a microprocessor. This is what the, actually Intel did. Intel has the 4004 chip. They immediately produced a board called SIM401 for simulating a simulation board that was to be used by engineers to experiment with 4004 chip to learn something, how it works, how it could be used. Now, uh, people in MIL said, well, that's fine, that's fine. Of course, you can do that, but we would like to build a, a, a computer, a really general purpose computer, and here it is. A truly general, that's actually a quote from Schweizer. A truly general purpose computer system at a cost with, 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 which is you know, a fraction of what you would pay for mini computer and, and mainframe. But the idea was, yes, this is, four, this is four bit architecture, but in many applications, you don't need these minis to run, I don't know, traffic light control on an intersection or some other application. It is enough to actually use the power of this four-bit four machine. So that was a manifesto. And uh, what is interesting is uh, the architecture. They want to have it uh, highly modular. Uh, something like you see here. So more or less a bus architecture and you'll be sticking. This is not CPS one, this is something else. But the same idea. Uh, you as an engineer, you, you would say, yes, I would like to have a CPU board. I, I need a, a memory and if I need more, I will stick another one and I will stick an IO board and what else do I need? Um, and that, that, that's, that, that was to make the user's life easier in designing a system. So that was the idea. They also developed a lot of software. Uh, yes, to write the software for the CPS-1, you need the mini computer or microcomputer, and, uh, and you could, uh, yeah, there was an uh, assembler, and, and there was an emulator, you could, you could test your, your, your software before actually pushing it into your computer. There were lots of application packages available on ROMs and, uh, and S listings. So, there was a lot of uh, things done. Uh, now it would be nice to to go and look at some advertisements and see at least how it looked like when it was being sold. And here it is, it's an earliest, <coughs> I apologize for, yeah, probably if I displayed half of it, it would be better. But this is the earliest ad of CPS-1, which I found in French electronic newspaper. And here it is, this, this is, uh, where is it? it here is uh, an ad for 7114, and below is CPS-1, and uh, the last uh, is uh, for 8008 CPU, and that's January 1973. That's the earliest ad for a microcomputer period. <laughs> if you are into that sort of games, in February you have announcement of a microcomputer from R2E, a French company. But again, it's, uh, I, I'm just showing you how early, how early they were advertising their, their, their computer. But as I said, other than these type of uh, ads, you can't find uh, a single you know, photograph or a single image uh, of a computer. So what do you do when you don't have that and you are desperate to know how easy, how nice, how convenient was to use CPS-1 in some applications. Okay, so this is what we did. We have collected in our museum many things, schematic diagrams, manuals, and so on. Uh, these are the official releases, and we did extensive interviews with uh, engineers working on CPS-1, and fortunately, one of these schematic diagrams in one of the corners had a drawing of the front panel. So we knew the arrangements of switches, lights, and what they meant, what they supposed to do. And uh, so here it is, uh, this is one of the schematic diagrams. They, they, these are some of the documentation. And uh, that's again uh, the CPU and some emails from engineers that we used. And uh, the result is, is, is this emulator. Uh, I will run it at the end of my presentation. Um, so the top part is the front panel with switches, the usual things, start and 
ups and breaks, break points and low lash emulator and deposit something in an exam, a particular memory, memory location. These are your address switches. Uh, these are your data switches. This is for data architecture, yes? So there are just four. On the bottom, that's, that's something that I've added. Um, so that's a one-line plasma display. And that's uh, from Burroughs Corporation. They, uh, they just introduced that type of device on the market. And um, this display was used in, in the Canadian MCM70 that was started to be designed at that time, around that time. So these displays were used. So we can, what you see here is this device uh, interface with the display, interface with the paper tape reader. And um, yeah, I would love to claim it's sort of 100% historically accurate, but uh, I would say only that we tried very much to have it as uh, accurate as we could from a historical point of view. And you can you can uh, you can use the emulator to run um, original software or software written by you, but you also have an access to hardware on various levels and module levels. Uh, and uh, you can even look at registers of CPUs, and um, um, you, could, you, you, you could do research on this emulator. Okay, so CPU, okay, this is what I said. But mode 8, this box. So let me tell you the story about this, because from now on we have examples of the remaining two computers, mode 8 and mode 80. And also a very interesting story because now we enter the domain of computer hobbies and I was just scanning people around today when I entered because I know that there are some TPAC members who were actually putting together this, 8000, this, 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 this computer or similar computers because there was another computer club in Toronto area, uh, Trace, probably the oldest Canadian uh, computer hobby. Club. And part of their early activities were to put together exactly these mode aids. So, brief history about this. Uh, so, here it is. By in 72, MIL has the right to manufacture 8008 CPU, which they, which they do, changing only Intel into MF. Nothing else. The same chip. <coughs> Now, what Intel was doing, Intel also was setting simulation board for it called Sim801. Sim801 was used for, yeah, experimentation with CPU, but also uh, program development. You could develop and test the program. Uh, uh, Sim801 could be interfaced with EEPROM burner, and you could um, Story programs, read programs, and so on. So that was that was that was interesting. However, the point was that when when, when MIL signed agreement with Intel, the agreement was only on chips regarding chips and technologies, but not on hardware. So they could not get SIM eight zero one and and rename it as MF zero one. So they had to put something together and and sell it for more or less the same uh, purpose. Hence, this box. They called it Mode 8, 8 for 8008. There was another version, uh, Mode 80, because that was, that's how it was using uh, this 8080 chip. This architecture inherited a lot from CPS1. So modularity and other things, all the philosophy behind the design of Mode 8 is inherited from CSM8. Uh, from the CPS one. And new names, uh, John Freeman, uh, the manager, but the hard work was done by, uh, by a graduate student from the University of Waterloo, who did not only the implementation uh, of, of the computer, but also wrote software and basically make it happen. Now, so that mode 8 was running on 8008 processor, and actually 
It was quite popular across North America, not only in Canada, as I will argue in a moment, but also in the States. And there is a nice relation to Apple computers and Steve Wozniak and, and, and so on. So let me, let me only show you, that's the board, that's the CPU board, that's MF8008 chip here, socketed. I have it here on this board. This is a slightly different board, but anyway. <coughs> no, probably it's exactly the same, the same board. Um, hello? <laughs> so here are the two versions. So if you wanted to upgrade to 8080 CPU, you, you just plug you, you just plug this CPU board rather than this one into the same box. And you, you, you had your hardware. That was the idea of modularity. That's the box, yes, so all together, when you put all together. There are some other things, but uh, there are a few extras. Here's a little EEPROM programmer, so you can store your programs there. That's a programmer you have to press and hold it for something like three minutes so that the chip is programmed. Doesn't matter how. That it was uh, it was um, capable of storing maybe 1K on the yeah. but that was. These were the times. Uh, that's not a CPU board, that's I think teletype board. Because the idea now is there are no lights, there are no switches. The idea was that this would be connected to teletype and you would operate by a computer that way. Yes, the manual. And I will talk, be talking about this manual for a longer period of time, but this turned out to be a very significant uh, 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 document for early hobbyists who were learning about microprocessors. And let me show you one. Okay, not yet. Okay. Very good. So, yeah, yeah you, my, I mentioned almost of it, with the exception of Tom Dale, who was that student at Waterloo, who, who was doing the implementation. He was hired as a, as a summer student, but he liked it that much that he actually <coughs> took a year break and actually finished the entire project, wrote software, wrote software and so on and so on. I couldn't trace that guy. I, can't, I, I don't know what happened to, to, to him. Definitely he, he has fantastic stories if he's still around. So maybe you are familiar with the gentleman. If you meet someone who say, by the way, I'm from the day of former, formerly from you of, of Waterloo, no, please tell me that. I would really love to, to meet him. Okay, now that's that's uh, that's interesting because uh, MIL was growing very very fast. They had subsidiaries all over the world, and 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 uh, among their places, they had two sales offices in California, Palo Alto, and uh, Santa Ana, uh, and. You, you would enter that sales office and would say, oh yeah, I'm interested in your product, you'll get the catalog and, and, and there would be more date and you could play with it. So many hobbies in Bay Area would be picking up these uh, manuals and they would be aware of uh, not only the hardware but the chip itself, the CPU. Okay, well, so this is what I try, what, this is what I would try to do, is I would try to take you now to the first meeting of uh, Homebrook Hall Computer Club, the world's famous, among the all the computer clubs. Uh, so the first meeting, yes, people are coming and saying, hi, how are you, uh, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, and it turns out that one of the, 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 the at some point, someone started to distribute this MIL, uh, uh, Manuals with 8,000 feet chip in. And this is recollection of Wozniak in his I was uh, book. So, yeah, I was scared and not, not feeling like I belonged, but uh, one very lucky thing happened. A guy started passing out these data sheets, technical specifications for a microprocessor called the 8008 from a company in Canada. And here is a nice story. He said, Wow, well, I, I really have to have this Canadian chip or something similar to that, and I will be building my computer. But this is, this is how people were learning about the, uh, the, uh, the microprocessor technology. And so happened uh, that in 2008, um, I played some role in it. So that's the first connection with the hobby movement, but there will be much, much more. Yes? That's the first indication. Uh, because this is the, the first meeting, meeting took place around the time when MIL was really 
fighting for the survival, and in a few years, there would be no, in a few months, there would be no MIL. Okay, so when the hobbies put their hands on it, they were not only attracted to the hardware, and the nice thing is that you could buy this in a variety of ways. You could just buy unpopulated boards, and you will be soldering all the stuff, ruining your dinner table, or you could buy it assembled. But also, MIL put together a very nice software. So Monitor, the Monitor software was very popular, and also um, Cassette's interface, uh, which was quite, quite popular as well. So among the hobby computer clubs that I traced that were playing with uh, mode 8, because this is what it is, it, the, 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 the box was intended for use by engineers, but these were mostly hobbyists that were buying and experimenting with it. So Chevron Research, San Francisco, that eventually merged with Humble Computer Club, uh, were playing with this and some of the boards here, and we have a complete system from them. Uh, in our museum. Then, of course, Trace uh, in Toronto that, that uh, was very big on Mode 8 hardware, and they were organizing a bulk purchasing from the Waterloo company Space Circuits. So Space Circuits would be offering inexpensive boards for Mode 8 and for Mode 80. And so, if you're interested, if you take a look at this, so some of the boards have MIL on it, and some of them they have S in the corner, which means that these boards uh, were manufactured by space circuits. So, very popular. I have a, yeah, here's a, <laughs> one of the trace newsletters in 1977. So, this is two years after the collapse of MIL. Uh, here's some information about Mode 8 and 80 user group. So what the Mode 8 80 user group is composed of upwards of 15 members. The group coordinator is such and such, the Mode 8, Mode 80 are microcomputer prototypes. <coughs> so here is some description what they have done and so on. 77 and still uh, going strong. Because Space Circuit was still offering these boards. Now, not only that, <laughs> the, the computer became so popular that many companies, especially related to computer stores in the States, started to sell Mode 8 and Mode 80 related hardware. So either directly Mode 8 and Mode 80, or some remakes of that, or improvements or variants. Especially Mini Micromart of Syracuse would be selling as Mode 8 and Mode 80, and that would be long after the collapse of the company. But also you have things such as Great Northern Computers. You've probably never heard about this Canadian company. So when MIL collapsed, one good thing that happened, uh, this company seeded uh, what is now called uh, Silicon Valley North. So all these companies, a majority of companies, the, the startups of the mid-1970s would be by engineers from MIL. So one of these companies was Great Northern Computers. What they did, they were just selling Mode 8 and Mode 80 using international contacts that they had. So they were selling it international. Uh, number one, Modocom uh, from Broadway, Ontario. Apparently, this was the company that bought a lot of things when MIL was auctioned. They said, yeah, we buy this, and we, we buy this building. And, but in the end, they, they, were, they were selling again Mode 8 and Mode 80 computers. But until 1978, especially Mini Micromart and Sertron, we're making all sorts of variants of Mode 8. You want to run Z80? Yeah, there will be a Z80 version. You want 6502? Uh, there will be a 6502 version. If there was 6502 at the time. Probably in 77 there was, yes? Because Pat was 64502. Oh, you know better than I do. So there were lots of that. Lots of this. And this is what I like. So yes, eventually, of course, they started selling it. Uh, they had Apple II surviving, uh, Radio Shacks, and uh, Commodore Pad. Uh, yes, uh, so of course, all these toys had to go. But this is what I like. This is the 76, what uh, <coughs> Mini Micro Mark writes about MIL, is why MIL is long gone. Their concept, their system concept will live on. That's, that was uh, the description of their attitude towards the design. Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> once MIL closed, did people switch to the Intel version of the chip to continue manufacturing the boards, or they, there was just a lot of chips left there? Well, this. First of all, there was no problem with, with the boards because space circuits supplied everybody with large quantities. Now, if you wanted mode 8, uh, you could plug in any, any, any either Intel 8008 or many other clones, and there were lots of these. I think on, on one of these boards we have, we have G8008, which is gold, no, I think a version of it. There were lots of these. And uh, our version of mode 80 came with actually Intel 8080 chip in it. So, so chip, chips were there, everything was there. It's the only thing board. Yes. And they were, as I said, very, these are double-sided, but really very well done. Quality of work on these boards is amazing. Uh, so you had boards, you had parts, and, just, and all possible innovations. Uh, innovations. Uh, it was Father Tom's somebody, I've forgotten the Bagini in the States, who in his spare time between prayers, he would be writing programs for Mode 8 and Mode 80 and would be publishing in a variety of uh, newsletters for hobbies. So, very interesting, very interesting atmosphere uh, created. And as I said, some of you, who I know, uh, to be eventually uh, members of your club, were building these as their first uh, computers. Okay. So that's the manual for, from uh, Great Northern Computers. This is basically the same manual, copy, the, the verbatim copy of the, of the MIL manual. That's from uh, Modocom. The, this is Mini Micro Mart, and this is uh, their version of uh, mode 80, C mode 80. Uh, what do I have? Oh, this is mode, mode Z80 board, yes, with Z80 chip instead of uh, uh, Intel 880. Uh, so yeah, all, all, all of that was tried and, uh, until probably 1978 when, when everything just stopped. Okay, I think that's, that's the last slide. That's if you want to learn about our resources, uh, and my other resources, you will find them here. And then what I was thinking about uh, doing is just to show you the CPS1 emulator, and if you want, you can take a look at uh, mode 8. So, let's get to... So here it is, you have your lights and switches, yes, so you, you do the obvious things, but initially, now what's nice is that the front panel is just a little bit of uh, a metal plate with switches, but there is no, there was never any hardware behind it. Uh, front panel is software operated, so software interprets all the presses and so on. And so, on. so front panel is a peripheral. Yeah. Same way you would plug in your memory, your, your analog to digital converters, the same way you would plug in the, the front panel. Yes. So we need, uh, we need a monitor program or boot program to actually have. So here it is. Um, what, I'm dying, uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm physically plugging a ROM chip with monitor in it. So now the program can correctly interpret the particular presses. So I can now load some data if I want to into memory. Yes, so it, you know, it's memory now. It's uh, let's set uh, memory into memory one and and let's set uh, fifteen and let's deposit. Okay, done. Oh, maybe I want to deposit something else in the following location. Here it is. Okay, so let's now see if we were successful. So let me clear this stuff. So now I can examine. So now the address in memory is zero. So if I say examine, uh, that will be the result. This is the uh, readout from that memory location. 
So there was nothing. I haven't inserted anything. I've inserted into one and two, memory location one. So let me uh, examine next. So in zero there is nothing. Here it is. Uh, that's the address one, and it's my my fifteen. And examine next uh, is whatever I have uh, inserted. So that's what it is. Uh, but of course. Uh, okay, let me uh, clear this. Uh, but of course I have paper tape reader and I can uh, read a program because my monitor program knows how to read stuff from a paper tape right now. This is how I wrote it. So let's select a program. Uh, I have a demo for it. Uh, CPS1 ready? No. Okay, here it is. Lots of programs written mostly by by students. So here I will just press to read and transfer information from the tape into memory. So now you will see paper tape reader reading the stuff. It will not take forever, it will stop eventually. Now the program loads starting at location 2048. This is 4-bit four, four processor, uh, so there is only 4K memory. And I loaded the, the, the program at this location. So if I set this address and say start, the program will start executing at this from this other location. And that's what will happen. Here it is, you have, you have a little demo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 accurate uh, emulation. That's what that plasma display could do. Uh, of course, everything depends what will happen when they collide. Yes. Yeah, we can offer some software. Uh, of course, the test for that was actually the calculator program. Um, and, uh, and this is part of the reason that I would like to do. Uh, Intel, of course, had its own 4004 chip that was used by Busicom and uh, the, the calculators uh, that they manufactured. And they were very successful in implementing the calculator uh, operations uh, using this, uh, uh, this chip. Here it is, here's an alternative. And so the first thing was, can we write, uh, can we write a calculator for this machine? And uh, yes, I, how, how much time do I have? If I don't. Forty-three? Yeah, so, uh, well. So let's let's load something else. So I decided to see if uh, if indeed calculator could be written for it. Um, so I wrote um, just a little bit of it. Uh, I can add. You know, um, multiplication was implemented as uh, several additions on the usual thing. Um, and because the, the next step would be okay, which would be more efficient as a as a as a calculator chip, whether it would be MF seventy one fourteen or Intel's four thousand four, that is yet to be experimented with. But anyway, so here it is. I re read it and let's run the program. Uh, uh, Twenty three point five. Yeah. 
And uh, where is plus here on my laptop? Okay, plus 34.66. And uh, so you, you could you could you could uh, safely implement uh, uh, a calculator on it. Uh, the only thing is, of course, to to count the the cycles and base. Well, first of all, MF7114, since it was simpler architecture, it was much, much faster than Intel's 4004. Uh, just to give you an example, this, had, this guy had 12-bit address. Uh, on the other hand, 4004 had 4-bit, and you had to, every address had to be sent in three cycles. So you, 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 you were gaining on speed even here. So our idea was to build the emulator will not only show how things could look like, but also to have it as a research tool to answer some of the questions, such as how calculators, how, you know, the, 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 the uh, effective power of calculators built uh, uh, around uh, that MIL chip, as opposed to other 4,000, uh, as opposed to other four-bit chips, such as 4,004. Anything else? Pardon me? Oh, well, <laughs> uh, I should have, uh, okay. Uh, you remember a game uh, called Bagels? Almost every LD. I don't know if it's working. Let's see, let's see what I have. Uh, some of them are sort of semi complete. Uh, but, okay, so let's, let's insert the boot ROM. Let's look at the tape. Scorpion, now it's more or less the same. However, there was a suggestion that that was uh, eight, you know, eight whole days. So this is what we used. And we are basically using it for uh, the bottom part to encode information. Because you have four bit information, and the upper part uh, as, as, as control bits. So for instance, if you want to switch from characters to digital information or some extra, ex, extra information to, to send control. Uh, in the, to the computer. Do we have the tape file format itself? Does that just contain binary information? Or? Oh, with hex. With hex? Yes. Okay. This is for bits, this is what you need, yes? Yeah, okay. No, I was just curious about the file format. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just, just hex. And Which, again, uh, internal, inter internal representation behind this is, of course, yeah. the, the, you, you have your integers between 0 and 15, but these are really hex. Right. Well, that's an interesting thing. We have what we have in our museum are two Univac tapes, magnetic tapes, with uh, probably the entire development system and some of the packages that they offer. And they offer lots of packages: editors, stream manipulation, all sorts of converters. Um, we don't have any ability to read Univac, old Univac tapes. So we're, really, we're waiting for an opportunity or for some volunteers with some hardware expertise who just uh, build the reader for us to just uh, suck out the information from it. So yes, potentially we have original software. And actually part of that uh, calculator is uh, published code that we, 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 we used. But, uh, but nothing really original. Oh yes, there is one, a random number generator. Well, random number generated between 0 and 15 with some, you know, de decent distribution. Um, 
Not yet. It will be. Everything will be. However, if you're in this right now, I can I can send it to you. There, there's one more of the little tiny thing that I have to do. I have to rewrite the manual for it for the emulator because we did last month the last changes and, and and they have to be introduced to the manual as well. But yeah, it, it will be available very soon. The only thing is to go to the page of our museum and it will be announced. Just click it and have, and, and you will have all the information how to install it. But as I said, you need just um, OpenGL and, and, and Glut to run it. Hopefully, these two pieces of software will survive something like 200 years or 300 years, so it doesn't matter what's the, your, what, what's the platform. Uh, as long as that software exists, you will be able to use the emulator. So this is sort of our guarantee that that information, that our work will, will survive uh, until the next um, uh, generation or future generation of historians would like to know more or ask questions that we have no idea that they will be asking. Uh, open source, yes. Yes, yes. That's right. I was thinking that we kind of funded your coding competition with a bunch of students to see if you can come up with something. Oh, that's fantastic, yes, because most of the coding was actually done by, by, by our students and they had a lot of fun. So uh, even right now, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that project stopped, but I, I hope it will resume. Obviously, you want to have Pong on it. This is what we do. We have a Pong on the time. Yes? Was it a keypad to enter the values? Like, for example, you... For calculator, yes, yes, yes. yes. And, uh, for programming? Yeah, so, uh, no, because you see, if you wanted to have a keyboard, the keyboard would be a peripheral, and it will be dealt with in exactly the same way. And that was a very simple architecture. So all the communication between peripheral roles were done by a, a piece of memory that you allocated. If you if if you if you if your address bus had a particular address, the keyboard says, "Oh yeah, that's me. They, they want something from you. Here I am." And yeah. you know, so in that way you can connect everything. That simple way: keyboards, keypads. Uh, this is how display works. This is how paper tape reader works. Everything, everything. This was very. Uh, this was the very idea, because that chip for your MF uh, seventy one fourteen doesn't have a style, doesn't have IOs on it. It's a really a very basic structure. So for instance, the chip to work requires virtual registers. And these virtual registers are the first 32 bits in memory. So you as a programmer should be aware of that the CPU will be using it as, as registers. But it works. I think PDP-8 did something similar. But that was very, a very simple chip. Yes. Uh, also, I'm sorry, is that noise? I'm sorry. Yeah. Do the virtual machines put a random number generator? Yes, 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 yes. And how would you send it? There were various ways. Okay, it's up to you because it was such a basic idea. So when we are running, running uh, this pro, when we are running any program that involves random number generator, typically we ask users to do something such as, do you agree that uh, 2 plus 2 is 4? And you say, have to say yes or no. And all the time the, the computer is waiting for your uh, answer, it's receiving the, uh, the generator. So, because we don't have any access to, to the clock or anything else, so we can't use the, uh, the other ways of it. So typically, yes, would you like to start the game? Yes. And a few cycles uh, passed by and and, and, and you're starting, you generated some, some other points. So, the obvious things. It's a really simple thing. This is really how computing, microcomputing started in Canada, with these ideas. Building a big computer out of a very, very simple, simple CPU. But it's so, so pristinely clean and transparent that if I were to teach computer hardware in the 70s or early 1980s, I, I would I would start with, uh, with CPS1 because you, you, you can teach everything in, in one hour. I mean, the architecture of the CPU, uh, memory management, everything, everything there. So, such, a, such, a, such an interesting, simple trick. Thank you very much again.